Hello, this is Jim Schaefer, the host and executive producer of Rip Rap, the academic book television program. Our de guest today is Lars Bjorn, the co-author of Before Motown, A History of Jazz in Detroit, 1920 to 1960. Welcome to Rip Rap, Lars. Thank you, Jim. Um, as I was saying before we started taping, uh, a number of people have talked about this book and they've been really interested in it. Great. It seems to have touched a chord uh, uh -huh. with people. And you were saying that you had sort of designed it so that it would be more accessible. Yeah, I was hoping that a lot of different kinds of people would be interested in the book. You know, obviously jazz fans, but also people who are interested in the history of Detroit, people who are interested in African American history in general. And, uh, you know, people are interested in this particular period, the 20s through the 50s. It, it certainly is one of the most intriguing narratives we've had on Rip Rap, I think. It, it's, it's because it brings together all those elements, and it's something that didn't seem to have paid any attention. Well, in fact, we should say right away that this is the first book of its kind on Detroit jazz, or the Detroit jazz scene, I guess you should say. Right. Yeah, no one has ever written about Detroit jazz yeah. in, in book form. The, there were a few articles before, and I wrote most of those. So <laughs> You got a corner on the market. Yes. And in the book, you say this was a 20-year project. Yes, yeah, it took a long time. Uh, it's hard to say exactly when I had the idea of a book, per se. It started out as uh, a problem I faced when I was teaching a course in, in the late 70s. I teach at the University of Michigan in Dearborn, and, yeah. and we were teaching a course on society and the arts in Detroit, Detroit culture for short. And uh, it was a team taught course, people from several disciplines, English, history, art history, and I'm a sociologist on it. And uh, we were picking up uh, different parts of the arts. And I said, I'll do music, because I have an interest in jazz and blues, which I knew was an important part of Detroit cultural history. Then when I went to the library, I found there was very little written. Uh, there was nothing basically written about it per se. The only thing you could find were articles about maybe individual musicians. But you know, they, they were very narrow and I wanted something broader. So what I ended up doing for the course was interview musicians. And this is just for a course and this is just last minute kind of thing, just rounding up some musicians and calling the musicians union and finding references and one person led to the other. So that's how it got started, and after doing that, I, I then started thinking of the general idea of doing some kind of research uh, and writing some research papers. And they were published in sociological and historical journals, um, you know, around 1980 or so. But then by the mid 80s, uh, I started thinking more of a book uh, as, as being a possibility. And, you know, once I got in tenure, which is what I got in the early 80s, and, and, you know, I could relax more. And, and you don't want to do a book when you're under tenure pressure uh, because it's very time consuming. And I knew this one would be. Um, one of the questions in the back of my mind is how did your original interest in jazz and blues originate? I know there was a mention of Sweden in there. But yeah, yeah, I'm born in Sweden. And that's where I grew up. I, I didn't come over here until uh, the late 60s. And uh, I was a jazz fan from age 12 or 13 or something. And you know, uh, that, that's the kind of music I listen to, jazz and blues, but jazz mainly. And who were your favorite artists back then? Oh, 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 you know, it, I started out first listening to Dixieland jazz, but that didn't last more than a half a year. And then, <laughs> then I became interested in modern jazz. Uh, you know, the people at the time, you know, Miles Davis, uh, all kinds of people. And, uh, and uh, you know, I was always interested in it, but I, I um, did come to America to study sociology, and I became a sociologist. I, I come here permanently in 1970, and I went to graduate school. And, uh, but it really is not until I start teaching up here in 74 at the University of Michigan Dearborn campus that I I start thinking about possibly doing research. And I had friends who told me all along, you know, you should do something with your jazz interest, you know, something scholarly. And I said, no, I don't want to do that. That'll kill it. You know, it, they kill the spontaneity of it to make scholarship out of it. Uh, but eventually I gave in. And of course, in hindsight, I'm glad I did. Oh, I think it's a wonderful thing because you add the, the research element combined with the passion for the music. So. Mm -hmm. 
there's a really interesting, um, a, a number of interesting patterns that kind of emerge. One of them is the relationship between the musicians and the community back and forth, uh, you know, with the, um, how the clubs emerged, how the musicians emerged, how they survived. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that was one of the other things that's really delightful is you've got all these interviews and firsthand knowledge of how that happened. Yeah. I, I mean, I wanted the book to be a way of telling the musician's story. That I, to liven it up, to make it accessible and come alive, you really need it in first person. And so you needed a lot of oral histories and, you know, to have as long quotes as possible. And I started doing in the mid 80s uh, interviews together with Jim Gallert, uh, who is my collaborator on this book. And we had both independently been doing some interviews. He did them for a radio program he had in Detroit. He was a DJ in Detroit. Uh, on, on public radio. Uh, I had done it, of course, as part of this research project. And uh, then we met in the mid-80s and decided, let's collaborate on a book. And so we started doing interviews together. And that was wonderful because with the two of us there, you know, there were very few questions we missed. When you're alone, you always remember all those things you've, you should have asked after you're through with the interview. Even if you come back, there are always things that you should have asked. Did you see a pattern in, in how or, uh, these interviews emerged and how they played out when you talked with people? Well, the general idea we had for how to go about doing the interviews was to start with the older people. I mean, it was, that was quite straightforward. You, you know, we knew this was a long-term project and you just simply start with the people who are the oldest who can go back to the late teens even, some of them, even though most of them go back to the 20s only. And, you know, it, of course, did turn out to be the case that many of the people we interviewed for the book are, are now past. Many are. So, you know, we really wanted to get to those people first and then kind of move forward in time very slowly. That was the general idea. Of course, what happens, too, is you get more proficient at interviewing and, and you gain more knowledge. You can ask better questions. And after doing a few interviews and, and doing a lot of background research, I did a lot of the newspaper research. Uh, it went through a lot of local newspapers uh, systematically over a number of years. And with that, uh, along with some photos that Jim really did, that was kind of his contribution, uh, we were able to really bring the dis make the discussions a lot more focused. And the musicians got really interested and were really surprised how much we knew about those days because they said nobody remembers this stuff. And we could can come in and say, here are some photos of people. Do you recognize any of them? Here I have some newspaper clippings uh, talking about you or someone you played with. And, you know, they were amazed to see these things. Well, one of the impressions I had is that in jazz, it's the, the specific person. And even the specific person at a specific period of time. I mean, you know, and that uh, was one of the interesting things. You, you have, your book has this long view, but there's also people who... Uh, who are at different places during those times. Yeah. And when you talk about jazz, it's so-and-so and how they played the drums or so-and-so and how they played the saxophone or yeah. what, what uh, kind of jazz they played. You know, jazz is a, is a very American art in many ways. But one way in which it is an American art, it's a very individualistic art form. I mean, the emphasis on improvisation and that everybody should have their own statement to make, their own voice in the music which is different from, say, traditional classical European music. Uh, you know, there's, where there's much less emphasis on improvisation, even though they all say, you know, Mozart, Mozart improvised in his day, but they kind of gave up on that idea yeah. as we move into the 20th century or late 19th century. Uh, so that I think that's, that's what's unique about jazz, and it really is, becomes a very personal statement, as well as a social one, I think, but it, it is, a personal statement and so there is a lot of attention to what individuals contribute to the development of music. In looking back, and this is probably a terrible question, but are there some of the people that stand out in your mind as far as, you know, personalities that just were so dominant and and formative to how the jazz was played? In Detroit? In Detroit. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there are many people who, who fit that bill. We didn't talk to all of them, of mm -hmm. course. 
but you know, they're, they're, I think the people who really stand out are the people who were strong mentors. They weren't only great soloists and you know, major soloists or group leaders. They were really mentors of younger generations. And this is something that also is part of jazz. Jazz is, an, is a music that survives through an oral tradition. Only in recent years has it been academized You've gone into the academy, taught at universities and high schools and so on. But I think still jazz is largely an oral tradition. It's musician, individual musicians who share their knowledge and insights with other musicians in a very informal manner. And that was definitely the case in this period that we're looking at from 1920 up to 1960. So, uh, you know, I think the people who were really important in Detroit were some of these grand teachers, like Barry Harris, who was a pianist, who was active in the, in the 50s, largely. Uh, Yusuf Latif, who was also active in the 50s. Uh, those are two master teachers as well as soloists. Uh, I guess Harris, probably of the two, is the one who is, who is more well known as a, as, as a teacher than, than Latif is. But they were both really, really quite important. And the third person is Thad Jones, who's a trumpeter. Uh, Latif was a tenorist. Uh, Thad Jones was, was a real leading figure and uh, someone who just had a great grasp on the whole enterprise and all the things that went into creating the music. And it seemed to be that a lot of these people, you know, were born or raised in Detroit and stayed there. I mean, they, they kind of built their music uh, yeah. culture, uh, but they really kind of form this community that they stay on. these most of these people who are mentors that I mentioned stayed around Detroit longer than the average person who became well known I mean mm -hmm. New York is the the place to make it in jazz that's been the case really since the 20s I think uh, and you know you, if you were going to be somebody in jazz you had to go to New York eventually uh, now most people will leave probably by their early 20s it's the you know it varies but a lot of people left around their 20s. These people stayed around another 10 years or more. And that is what's unusual. And, and they, you know, they, they found something in Detroit. Now, eventually, they leave too and go to New York, which is why we know their names. That's why they are well known. I mean, if you stay in Detroit all your life, you're only going to have a local reputation. Only among musicians might you be known nationally. But, you know, if you stay in Detroit and don't go anywhere, you will not record, for example. And that's a real drawback to Detroit, is it never really had any major jazz recording activity. There were some smaller labels, but it just does not compare to even living in a place like Chicago, where they at least had one or two labels that recorded jazz. New York is, of course, the place to record jazz, as well as Los Angeles, eventually. Uh, the other question in my mind is, why was there such a lag? I mean, you know, you're the one that's contributed now with this book, but why hasn't this come out before? Is it the, pro the situation you mentioned before with scholarship in general having difficulty or finding it a challenge to get into a, uh, a, an audio uh, dynamic kind of uh, a thing like jazz? Is, is that what it is? Well, I mean, part of it is the lack of recording, that, you know, people had less interest in it because there were less local recordings. Uh, then I think the other one is that Detroit doesn't have a particular style of jazz associated with it, the way Chicago does or Kansas City and certainly New Orleans. You know, they are cities that are jazz cities in the sense that they have a unique style of jazz associated with them, usually from earlier periods before World War II. And Detroit doesn't really. Uh, in a major way have this. So I think that's one reason why there has been less interest in Detroit. Detroit, the way I see it, is really part of the New York scene. It's, a, it's an outgrowth of the New York scene. It, people in Detroit were in very close communication with what was going on in Detroit, just but like people in Philadelphia would They circulate back and forth. Yeah. yeah. Are, they go back and forth. Uh, you know, a lot of people from New York come here to play. They come here to play, they pick up other players from Detroit and then go back to New York or are on a tour or something like that. So it's a constant interchange of ideas. And Detroit was really part of that whole national network of jazz and a very important part of it. I found it fascinating about the role of the clubs. And, and you know, there'd be some clubs that come up for a while and then disappear, but the, the, 
when I talk jazz with people, they're talking about Baker's Keyboard Lounge or the Bluebird Inn, and they just went on for decades. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the Baker's is still going. Right? Yes, it is. That they they claim that they are the world's oldest jazz club. I discuss that in a footnote. You know, the, yeah. the, the Village Vanguard in New York also say they are the world's oldest jazz club. So. It's a matter of definition. But they are definitely one of the oldest jazz clubs. When you say those names, I mean, yeah. people say, oh yeah, I've been there, or they, they, there's a certain style or music that they, uh, they're associated with. And, uh... But the typical jazz club has a very short life. I mean, jazz clubs is not really a great way to make money. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's kind of incidental often to what the bars are all about in terms of money making, you know, like selling drinks. <laughs> uh, the music is often incidental, and and that's been one of the difficulties, of course, for jazz is is also surviving under these conditions. It's difficulty in then tracing what happened over the you know a long view, uh, because a, an institution like a bar or a, you know a club like that gives you some perspective on it. So th that was what fascinated me is that the, you've already mentioned that, but the, you did the interviews, you did the research with the different uh, newspaper, was right. the Michigan Chronicle, and other things like that. So there was all this piecing together of what happened. And that's the thing that fascinates people is because, just like you were saying earlier, um, they, they know from having gone to the clubs and having relatives or friends go to concerts or play, but no one had pieced together the large picture, and so to see this all come together is a, quite a lot of fun. And then the pictures, too, add to that excitement yeah, right. that people... I've, I mean, the book has just been coming out the last few weeks, and, yeah. and, and we've had several book signings, and I've talked to a lot of people, and the people who really seem to enjoy it a lot are the people, of course, who were there. Yeah. And they'll just open the book and turn one page uh, after the other and, and look at the pictures. And that just That's been my experience. Yeah. You show them the book, and yeah. then you know, I tell them things like, you know, there's the locations of the, cl you know, the clubs, and they're looking at that. Right. And this one woman I talked to just this afternoon, she looked at the list of artists, you yeah. know, and it happened that her father wasn't listed. But, I mean, you know, it's, right. uh, there's a limit. Uh, but still, that's what they're checking, all that, because this is personal knowledge that they have and they're looking for what they know. And she was really impressed, I might say, that you know, when you make it on that kind of thing, that I think is not only scholarship, but that's a different kind of level that is almost a, a community need or something. It, the, like you were saying, the people um, really are looking for something that might document it, because it was almost a subculture in a way. It was a very distinct one. But oh, sure. And, and you know, as I said, if jazz is so much carried on through an oral history, uh, you know, the tradition itself, it's also easy that a lot of this knowledge would just simply evaporate and disappear. I mean, it really takes on a different meaning once it gets into print, and that, I think, was a, was a very important task. And I, I was in the privileged position of having a university job, and, you know, we have more time to write than most people do. And, uh, you know, an so... An interview. I yeah, guess. an interview. So I could, I could spend some time putting this into print, and that's... You know, there are a lot of people out there who call themselves jazz historians, and they've collected all kinds of information, but the books never get written, because uh, they don't have the luxury that I did of having a university job, where we, part of our job is presumably to do research, and uh, that includes, of course, writing. I was going to ask you about that, because every once in a while you sort of mention jazz historians, and I, I get the impression that, well, they're a tolerated group, but... Uh, uh, do you consider yourself uh, in that genre or uh, of people who, or what is your stance in terms of jazz and writing about it? I, mean, I know you're a sociologist, but you're primarily interested in the history of it or the social formations yeah. in response to the dynamics through a. You know, I'm not, time? I'm not, for example, a musicologist. You know, I, I yeah. have no formal musical training and I, I, I am very hesitant to make uh, too many musical judgments. And that, that wasn't really something that was necessary to do in this project either yeah. because there are so few recordings. Yeah. We really didn't have much to go on except what people said about the music. We couldn't listen to anything or very much independently. Uh, so I see myself more as a, a, a social historian. I mean, that's kind of what I really am interested in in general is kind of social history, and, and which includes, I mean, in this case, cultural history. And, you know, that I'm able to somehow put this into print, and I think it, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to kind of be able to have, it, have some local significance and give back to the community 
uh, after they have given so much to me by, you know, in these interviews. Because that's one thing that happens in interviews is that you really get to know people a little and it's a network situation where one person you talk to refers you to another and eventually you develop this whole network of people that you know. Now, at the same time, I have been involved, as has Jim, in various jazz activities. You know, I've been involved in something called the Detroit Jazz Center around 1980 or so, along with John Sinclair, Herb Boyd, and a number of other people, which was uh, an effort to, to do, s on the one hand, research around jazz in Detroit, but it's also a performance center. And for many years, I've now been active in Southeastern Michigan Jazz Association, where I write the newsletter. I'm the editor of the newsletter. So I try to do all kinds of things surrounding jazz uh, and gotten to know a lot of contemporary musicians. So. I feel I've gained a, a new kind of family in a way, you know, this whole getting to know people in this community, partly through doing the book, but also through doing these other things. And, and they feed on each other. And that's been a very nice thing. And so it's kind of a combination of, of uh, you know, community activity, a research interest, and then, of course, this personal interest as a jazz fan. But I think it was this personal interest and involvement in the community that, that made it possible to write the book because you are dealing with an oral situation so you're not going to be able to walk into the to the U of M graduate library, wonderful as it is, and look under you know Detroit Jazz and find anything. You might in terms of maybe some specific people along the way but uh, you know there's been some uh, uh, about Charlie Parko, I know it's just you know he was one of the people played on the way through, and we talked a little bit about that before the interview. But still, to find out what was happening, you have to talk with the people. Um, and there, there, there are a lot of people. I mean, uh, one of the groups was the McKinney Cotton Pickers, and right. they, you know, and they seem to to span, you know, quite a period of time. Yeah, they were very important all the way into the 30s. Uh, they, they, they were a group that recorded in the late 20s into the early 30s, and then their recording contract ended, and that was basically it, but they survived after that. It, it was, I think, one of the two groups that really put Detroit on the map nationally. It was a wonderful group. Uh, and. One thing that made it wonderful is that they were able to lure a lot of musicians from New York here. Detroit in the 20s was one of the places to be. You know, it was dynamic Detroit. This was a city that was just booming in the 20s. So it was a place to come. And that's hard maybe for us to see today, you know, given how Detroit has changed dramatically. But it's a city that grew rapidly and then it declined rapidly. And in the 20s, it was Boomtown. And, and it was so for musicians, too. So it brought an arranger named Don Redmond to town. And he became the musical leader of the Cotton Pickers for a few years. And that was kind of its heyday. And that's when they had a lot of great recordings made. And the other group was a white group, uh, the Gene Golkett Orchestra. Gene Golkett was someone who never really played jazz, but he, he, he he owned. He ran this band, mm -hmm. and he was a he was a manager of many other bands, and he owned or managed the Greystone Ballroom in Detroit, which is where both the Cotton Pickers and the Grace, the the Goldcats Greystone Orchestra played. And that group had all kinds of luminaries in it, like Big Spiderbeck and the Dorsey Brothers, and all these people who became something uh, in the white jazz community. So the Greystone was was a fabulous place on a, on a national scale. And uh, you know, I tell this interesting story in there, which which is well known, but it was told to us by uh, Dave Wilborn, who was one of the founders of the, of the Cotton Pickers, and uh, he lived into the 70s. And he talks about how the group got its name, which I think is an incredible story. Uh, you know, they they were originally from Springfield, Ohio. It was called Cinco, the Cinco Septet, uh, and a number of other names like that. Uh, and when Goldkit heard them in Toledo, he said, why don't you come up and play in Detroit? And they did. And he said, after they played in Detroit, we were an enormous success. And he said, uh, why don't you change the name of the band so that it gives people the idea that you are from the South? And they said, well, why should we do that? We're from Springfield, Ohio. <laughs> and he said, well, I think that would, that would be a good idea commercially. So why don't you call yourself the Cotton Pickers? And, you know, they did not like it at all. Here are these people from Springfield, Ohio, 
who are generally from a middle class background, some of them have, have been educated uh, beyond high school, and you know, and they're, they're, they're supposed to be as if they were just off the plantation in the South. It's an absurd idea and obviously insulting. But, you know, he told him, he said, well, you can give the name up once you leave my engagement. But if you want this job, this is what it's going to be. And the uh, final threat. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't Goldcat personally. It was his manager who told him this. But, you know, and they said, okay, we'll do that. But, of course, what happened is they became so successful that it would be foolish for them to give up that name because they were identified with the name. And it stuck. And they were, of course, not the only ones that had names like this. This was really part and parcel of black and tan entertainment. Then we come to the to the big question that's implied by your title about how what was happening with the jazz in Detroit, um, then its influence on the famous Motown sound of Barry Gordy. When people think about music and Detroit, they think about Motown. That's the first thing that comes to mind. People do not think of jazz. People do not think of blues. They think of Motown. And, you know, what, of course, uh, I argue in the book, uh, along with Jim, is that Motown could not have happened if it weren't for jazz. The creation of the Motown sound is not simply something that Barry Gordy did. Barry Gordy sat there, and he knew what he liked, but it was, it was the musicians who worked out all the sounds, who, work, who came up with all the ideas, and then he'd say, oh, I like that, play that again, etc. You know, he would pick and choose from their ideas, but it was their ideas originally. And only musicians who are skilled, only musicians who are good at improvising would do good under those kinds of conditions. And these were people who had backgrounds in playing of jazz as well as rhythm and blues. So a long history of rhythm and blues development, too, that starts in the 40s by the time Motown em emerges in 1959, which is at the very end of our, of our time period, in that, the last chapter of the book, which is about R&B. And then before we end this program, we should talk about the exhibit that's going on as the book is coming out. Yeah, we have had an exhibit that opened up in Detroit July 1st uh, at the Museum of African American History. And it's a photo exhibit based on the book. The, the book has 75 photos that has over 100 illustrations total. Uh, you know, we have maps and so on. And this exhibit includes about 30 to 40 of the photos that we really think are, are, are spectacular enough that they can be part of a photographic exhibit. And they're shown at the Charles Wright Museum of African American History in the Detroit Cultural Center, just behind the newly opened Science Museum. Well, what I thought was really interesting about the book is <clears throat> functions as scholarship, but really as a kind of a gift to the back to the community, and um, it the, you've organized it wonderfully along those those lines. So that, it, like I said, there's intense interest with the people. I thought they said, "What you know?" And I talked to them, and and I think there, there's a lot of people, particularly African Americans, but others too, right. who are saying, "Well, that's really interesting." You know how it was organized. So. Thank you for being on Rip. Well, it's been a pleasure, Jim. Thank you. Mm -hmm.